I have a message tonight titled Judge Righteous Judgment, which I'm actually bringing as a follow-up and a supplement to the great message that Brother Joshua Jocelyn preached about this time last month in my absence, which he titled Judge All Things, uh, in which Brother Josh refuted the standard judge not that you be not judged mantra or motto or slogan that's recited repeatedly by both unsaved pagans and also by ignorant Christians alike when confronted with their own sin and their need for repentance. Judge not. You're not supposed to judge me. Only God can judge me. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And as I stated before, I actually left the floor wide open for Brother Josh to preach whatever the Lord laid on his heart. Uh, but if Brother Josh had informed me uh, beforehand he was going to preach on that topic, I would have probably said no way because I should have preached on that long ago, a long time ago. And I want to do it. However, Brother Josh beat me to it. He actually brought a, a very timely, much-needed message on the on the topic that I would encourage you all, if you've not heard, to go online and listen to Judge All Things. Um, tonight, I'm going to add a few points to that message that I believe we all need to bear in mind just to stay balanced, as we are all exhorted not only to judge all things, as the Bible says that we as Christians are exhorted to do, but also to judge righteous judgment. So turn to Matthew chapter 7 and also to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Again, I would encourage you to go listen to Brother Josh's message if you haven't done so already, because the Bible does say that Christians, the righteous, we as the righteous, who have been declared righteous by the blood of the Son of God, we're not only enabled to judge righteous judgment and to call sinners to repentance, but we are in fact commanded to do so. Many is the time over the years that I have pointed out others' sins to them to try to bring them to repentance for their sake and to try to help them to see their need for repentance, only to have them repeat that familiar Bible verse of Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For many, or actually for most, that cite that verse, is probably the only verse in the Bible that they know or have memorized. Wow. And never do they know what it truly means in its context. And in my life, every time that verse is thrown in my face, my standard response has been, not only as Brother Josh preached that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, that Christians are called to judge all things, but also that we are called to judge righteous judgment, not in hypocrisy. That's what that means. That's, of course, that's what the Lord's point is here in Matthew chapter 7. Which, let's, let's read this, starting in verse 1. The Lord Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? you got a worse sin than he does, Jesus is saying here. Thou hypocrite! First cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Repent of your own sin first, Jesus said, and then you'll be able to help your brother repent also, which you're still supposed to do. Another aspect of judging righteous judgment is that a righteous judgment is to be uh, driven by the proper motive. Uh, in love, and for the purpose of restoration, as Josh pointed out in his message, of course. And we are not to do as the highly judgmental Pharisees did, whose motive was to put others down, and to, to put others in bondage to their own man-made rules that a lot of so-called Christians uh, do want to try to do. We'll come back to that momentarily. So while we are not to be judgmental hypocrites, we are to judge. And we are also to hold both ourselves and others accountable to God's standard of righteousness that he reveals in his word, not to our own standards. Amen. One of the reasons that actually that we are called to holiness and to sanctification and to separation from sin and, sin and to live exemplary lives is so that we will be in the proper condition and position to do as the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 58 verse 1, where he says, cry aloud. Fair not, 
Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression, Isaiah says, in the house of Jacob, their sins. That's what we are supposed to do. We're supposed to cry aloud and spare not. Show the people their sins that they might repent and come to Christ. I believe that's partly what Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, when he said, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 1 Corinthians 2, this is actually a very good passage, I think, to show a person who is quick to cite the judge not verse, the judge not mantra. Verse 14, Paul says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Paul's talking here about the unregenerate man who has not been born again. In verse 15 he says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Then Paul says, But we have the mind of Christ. What does Paul mean in saying that we have the mind of Christ? He means, in contrast to the unsaved man in verse 14, that the spiritual man in verse 15, the man who has been born again, who has a mind that has been quickened or made alive, redeemed from spiritual death, to be able to receive the truth of the word of God. That's what that means. By a supernatural act of God, God has quickened our minds so that we are now able to come to repentance, to hate sin, and to cry out for salvation. And then, to hate what God hates, and to love what God loves. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ, to be born again, to hate what God hates, to love what God loves. In other words, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, as Jesus said that the blessed would do in Matthew chapter 6. So that's what it means to have the mind of Christ. As it is, By the way, it's a supernatural act of God that he works in the new birth when we're born again. The natural, unregenerate, non-born again man has no appreciation or desire for the things of God or for the word of God. No desire to know it, can't understand it. It's foolishness to him, as Paul says here. The natural man also has no understanding of the debt or of the due penalty of his sin. He has no spiritual vision. He cannot see the kingdom of God, as Jesus said to Nicodemus. And the natural man operates on worldly wisdom, rather than on the wisdom of God. And worldly wisdom, by the way, is very dangerous and deceptive, and is exactly what's taking billions of lost souls to an eternal hell. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Paul says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God. After that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. In other words, by what the natural man sees as foolishness to save them that believe. Paul says, For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Worldly wisdom is what they seek after, by the way. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, and, by the way, to the natural man, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So the natural man, the unregenerate sinner, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That means they can only be understood by one who has been born of the Spirit. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, 3 through 5, He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It means he can't perceive it. And he also said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because he will not be able to receive the truth. He won't have any perception of the truth. He won't be able to do that. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. That's, that's, by the way, why Nicodemus replied, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
See, Nicodemus was operating on worldly wisdom. First he said to Jesus, We know that you're a great teacher come from God. But Jesus, in effect, replied, You have no idea who I am. And if you, but if you had the mind of Christ, if you had been born of the Spirit, you'd know that I was far more than a great teacher, basically is what Jesus replied to him. So Paul says the natural man, the unregenerate sinner, receiveth not things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Paul also says, by the way, in Romans chapter 1, that the wicked have been turned over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind. When we get saved, we're given the mind of Christ. Our mind is healed in a sense. The spiritual man who has been born again and therefore can see the truth of the kingdom has been given the mind of Christ. His eyes have been opened, the truth of God's word. He's a new creature with a new nature, with a new hatred of sin and a thirst for righteousness. And Paul says that he's actually even been given a new sense of sanity. Sanity amidst the craziness and the insanity of this world. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of what? A sound mind. Amen. That comes with being born again. Given a sound mind. When before we had been turned over to a reprobate mind. So this passage actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 uh, can be a great scripture for soul winning. You can open up a conversation by pointing at, point out a sin they need to repent of. And when they reply with the judge not verse, you know, that only God is their judge, tell them that the Bible says as a Christian, you are to judge all things also. Show them this passage. Have them read it aloud to themselves. And ask that person if he thinks he has the mind of Christ. And then go to John chapter 3 and explain what it means to be truly born again. But whether you use this passage or not, declaring someone's sins to them can be, a very, and really is, a very good way, if not the only way, to open the door to the gospel. That is the example set by the Lord Jesus, by the way. In John chapter 4, uh, contrary to Jewish custom, the Lord Jesus said he must needs go through Samaria. Because there is a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well there in Sychar that needed to hear the gospel. He didn't use a gospel tract and didn't go down the Romans road per se. Uh, he told her that he could offer her living water that would spring up into eternal life. But then he told her that he knew all about her sin. In John 4 verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. In verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou, thou now hast is not thy husband, and that sayest thou truly. In other words, you're living in sin and adultery, you've already had five husbands. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Astute observation. But then she went back to the town and brought the men of the town out to see this Jewish prophet who knew all about her, but he went out of his way to talk to her anyway. In verse 29, she said to the men of the town, Come see a man who has told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And these Samaritans then in John chapter 4 are actually the first converts that we read of in John's gospel who had this reaction in verse 40. When the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. We don't read about that kind of reaction elsewhere in the book of John. And this happened because Jesus let this woman know that he knew that she was a sinner. As Christians, we are to judge all things. And further, we are to call sinners to repentance from their sin. That's what it means to be the salt of the earth, by the way. That's why Jesus said in Luke 5, verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And in Luke 24, verse 47, he said that repentance and remission of sins 
should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so we too, like those early apostles, are supposed to call sinners to repentance. That's what we're supposed to do. So then, as born-again Christians who have the mind of Christ, we are not only enabled to judge righteous judgment and to call sinners to repentance, but we are in fact commanded to do so. To briefly summarize some of the points that Josh made in his message, before adding a couple more that we also need to remember. Uh, first, I want to uh, repeat some of the statements that Brother Josh made in introducing the subject. Uh, Josh mentioned that the message of those who claim judge not is all about excusing sin and mass, about bringing, bringing the standard down to the level of the sinner so that we're all comfortable with sin and no one can judge and we're all, we've all sinned, so stay out of my business. However, the message of judge righteous judgment is the exact opposite. It's that all sin is inexcusable, both in he which is doing the judging and he which is being judged. All sin is inexcusable in God's eyes. And the standard has been risen to the level of holiness. And that's the, that is the standard that we are all to pursue, holiness and perfection. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard that we're to pursue. Very good points there to remember. As for Josh's main points, he said, number one, that we need to rebuke openly those who err openly. That means to their face. Proverbs 27, verse 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 20, them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. That verse, by the way, needs to be applied very carefully, I would say. I apply that verse to them that sin openly, whose sin is known to all. Them that sin openly, uh, whose sin is known to all, rebuke before all, but others also may fear. Another point Josh made, point number two, was that heretics that promote heresy publicly should be rebuked publicly. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Joshua's third point was that we should be specific and should not spare professing Christians. And number four was that such judgments and rebukes should be made in love to restore and to correct. And I would say that last point should, can, cannot be overemphasized. When you do take it upon yourself to try to help someone by showing them their sin and their need to repent, make sure that they know that your motivation is in love and for their good. Otherwise, you won't get anywhere. Turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. So in a nutshell, those were some of the main points of Brother Josh's message. I would encourage you again, if you haven't heard that, to go back and listen. Uh, but to that message, I want to add a few words about righteous judgment. In John chapter 7, let's start reading in verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. And by the way, we've got a lot of preachers today speaking of themselves. Right. Put the Bible down and just preach what they, what they feel like preaching. But he that seeketh his glory, the fathers that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus said, speaking of himself. He said, verse 19, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? See, the Pharisees were already after Jesus by John chapter 7. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. Jesus answered and said to them, I have done one work to heal on the Sabbath day, by the way, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. In other words, Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, etc. And ye, on the Sabbath day, circumcise a man, if man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, 
Are you angry at me because I made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? And they said this, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Very important verse. Not only judge righteous judgment, but judge not according to the appearance. Interestingly here, righteous judgment is contrasted with judging by appearance. In looking at this subject, we need to point out that there is a big difference between righteous judgment and the unrighteous judgmentalism of the Pharisees, or the or Phariseeism. One is constructive and restorative and can lead others closer to Christ and to repentance, which, by the way, is always the goal, whether we are trying to restore fallen Christians or lead the unsaved to Christ. But the other is destructive and does nothing to bring a person closer to Christ, whether saved or unsaved. Sometimes we as Christians are a bit too much like the Pharisees, I think, and are far too quick to judge by the appearance. Sometimes we're too quick to judge. We judge too quickly. We make snap judgments without knowing all the facts. We're also at times too quick to judge a person to be unsaved who very well may truly be saved. We need to not be so quick to do that. We are not only enabled to judge righteous judgment and to call sinners to repentance, but we are commanded to do so. That means both the unsaved and those who are saved, both of whom must be confronted about their sin so they can come to the point of repentance before they can either be saved or restored. And both of whom, by the way, must be approached with a proper spirit of meekness. I have three main points I want to go over that I would add to the points that Josh raised in his message to help us all stay in balance as we do judge all things as we're commanded to do. And number one, as we are judging all things, we need to judge ourselves first. Judge ourselves first. The other points two and three, two we'll get to is that we need to make sure that we're judging by God's standard not man's. And number three is that we need to be very cautious in judging another man's salvation who claims to be saved. we are going over all three of these points. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Uh, the Apostle Paul makes it quite clear that as Christians we are to confront other believers who have surrendered themselves to sin. But he also says that as we are judging all things, we need to judge ourselves first. Paul says here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, this is a very important verse. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, which he defined back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. First of all, we need to take note that Paul is talking here about the restoration of a fellow believer in Christ. Context makes that abundantly clear. The, the goal here is restoration of the one who has fallen, not the initial salvation of the one who has lost. Therefore, we have an important point here. Just because we see a brother who is overtaken in a sin, that doesn't mean the man is not saved. You may see a man who's overtaken in sin, who is saved. Paul's talking here about restoring a brother who's overtaken in sin. Some Christians actually may even, born-again Christians, may actually resign themselves to that sin, thinking they are hooked, or perhaps that God will maybe allow them to have just that one sin. That doesn't mean they're not saved. It means that they need to be restored. And reminded that God will not allow them to surrender to that sin. We'll come back to that point. Second, Paul makes it very clear that when we see a brother who is overtaken in sin, that man is to be confronted with his sin and with his need for repentance. We're not to just leave him and let him wallow in his sin. That's our job as Christians. But Paul also says that confrontation must be done in the right spirit. First Paul says here, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. That means not only you who are saved, but that means you who are walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. You who 
are not yourselves overtaken in some sin. In other words, as we are judging all things, we need to judge ourselves first. This, by the way, of course, in perfect harmony with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. How wilt, I say, how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the moat out of thine eye? Behold, the beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast a beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Paul says, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, which means, Ye who have already pulled the beam out of your own eye. That's what he means. And once you've done that, the goal then is to restore such a one. The original word here translated restore is that it's actually the same word that's used to refer to the repair or the resetting of a bone that was either broken or out of joint. That's what that word was used for. Which, by the way, is actually a very good picture of a Christian that has fallen into sin. They're out of their place. They've lost their joy and their usefulness. And they are definitely to be restored by gently reproving them. Gently reproving them for their sin to let them know that they cannot give in to it and to help them overcome it. The goal is not to belittle them or to puff ourselves up as being more holy than they are. Paul says in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That means, first, in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness, not bearing down hard on them or scolding and upbraiding them for being so carnal, but gently admonishing them as a brother to restore them. Well, by the way, at the same time, of being fully aware and mindful and conscious of our own weaknesses and propensity to sin, that we are still in this body of flesh ourselves, that's also susceptible to temptations of the devil, that we can fall ourselves into the same sin. And we should then, therefore consider how we would want to be admonished by another brother if we had fallen instead of they. Paul says, considering yourself, lest you too be tempted. That's the reason for Paul's instruction here. We are to stand with our brothers as fellow soldiers who are all engaged in the same warfare and struggle against sin. And when a fellow soldier falls, we're to help him get back up and into his rightful place of service. That's the purpose for this passage. So then, number one, we are to judge all things, and in doing so, we need to judge ourselves first. Number two, we must always make sure that we are judging by God's standard, not man's. We are to judge by God's standard, not our own. Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. I need to add another aspect here, actually, of the meaning of Paul's qualification for confronting others with their sin. But when Paul says, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, I think we should add here, that phrase not only means you who are walking in the spirit, not in the flesh, who have already pulled the beam out of your own eye, but in order to be able to effectively help restore another brother, I believe a Christian really must be mature enough in the faith or must know God's word well enough to know that he is judging by God's standard, not by his own. And not by perhaps his favorite spiritual hero or favorite preacher, who also, by the way, may well be a novice in his understanding of the scriptures. As Christians, we are to daily exercise judgment. But on the other hand, we are not to be unduly judgmental of others. We must never judge another from a position of pride or haughtiness. By the way, a prideful person is very quick to judge others and to point out others' faults while excusing his own sins, his own faults, and he judges others far more harshly than he judges himself. We are called to make righteous judgments. We are to cry aloud and spare not, to preach out against sin. We are to separate ourselves from sin and from sinners. We're supposed to reprove the darkness that prevails in our society. We're called upon to rebuke others at times when they are in a sin that needs to be repented of. We do need to judge, but we do need to be careful not to judge others too harshly or in hypocrisy. And by the way, we are sometimes way too quick to judge before we know all the facts. Paul says, he who is spiritual judgeth all things. We are to judge all things, but he also says we need to keep this in balance. In Romans 14, verse 4, 
Paul says, Who art thou that judgeth another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. We need to take that passage into account here. Who art thou that judgeth another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. A mark of humility is the ability to judge oneself before he judges others. A humble person is self-examining rather than feeling qualified to sit in judgment of others. And while many Christians are not nearly sensitive enough to their own sin and are much too condoning of sin in their own lives or in others, there is also a pride that develops sometimes in immature Christians that causes them maybe after they've learned enough of the Bible, to think that they've arrived. Uh, they consider themselves capable or worthy of judging other Christians in areas of Christian conscience or perhaps Christian liberty uh, for things that really may not be sent. Many examples we could cite, dress standards, going certain places, movie theaters, shopping in certain stores, having a TV in your home. A lot of these things that are a matter of conscience and liberty that some immature want to judge others for. Paul deals with this issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And he uses the example there of eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. Which actually a new believer in Corinth would have thought to be an abominable sin. That must be a sin to eat a meat sacrificed to idols. Paul says, we know the idol is nothing. We who are mature know that idol is nothing. That is not a sin to eat a meat sacrificed to an idol. But Paul says, for the sake of that weaker brother, I will not wound his weak conscience by insisting on my Christian liberty, which might cause him to feel he's free to sin. We don't want to do that. We are accountable to each other in the body of Christ. But a humble person is first self-examining rather than feeling qualified to sit in judgment of others. I could say a whole lot more on this issue, but... Suffice it to say that we, meet, we must be careful uh, to avoid the sin of the Pharisees who judged others by their own standards uh, rather than God's. In Mark chapter 7, verse 5, Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Verse 6, he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He says, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We've got a lot of Pharisees today and a lot of Baptist churches teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. He said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Some Baptists do the exact same thing. They have their traditions that they call their standards. But their standards are rules of men, but have often very little scriptural support. In judging righteous judgment, let's be sure that we call sin what God also calls sin. Number one, as we're judging all things, we need to judge ourselves first. Number two, we need to make sure that we're judging by God's standard, not man's. And then number three, we need to be very cautious in judging another man's salvation who claims to be saved. Sometimes we judge by appearance only. And as a result, we're too quick to judge someone to be in sin before we know all the facts. That's a grave error. Another serious error, though, is that sometimes we're far too quick to judge that because someone is involved in some sin and also actually may be very resistant to correction, we may wrongly conclude that person must not be saved when, in fact, they may well be. I've preached enough sermons on make-believers and fake believers for you all to know that I fully understand that there are many, many, Jesus said, who claim to be Christians but who are not truly born again. As I stated recently in a series of messages on the security of the believer. While I do believe that once a person is truly saved, born again by the power of God, he is once and forever saved. He is kept for salvation by the power of God. 
I believe in the eternal security of the believer, but I also believe in the infernal insecurity of the make-believer. There are many of what the Apostle Paul called in a couple places false brethren. False brethren who call themselves Christian but are not truly saved. Who have been deceived by one or more of a multitude of the devil's lies into thinking or maybe at least hoping that they're saved but who are not truly born again. They believe they're saved and secure because they're trusting in their family heritage maybe or their baptism or maybe even some ritual sinner's prayer that may have prayed 20 or 30 years ago from which time they've never shown any spiritual growth whatsoever. There are many who believe that a loving God would never send them to an eternal hell but who were in fact not saved and who may well be in fact on their way to just such a fate. That's why the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, you know, those that cite Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, they need to read on into this chapter. Because in, chap in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus then says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The Lord Jesus said that there are many, notice he, he used that word many, make believers who call Jesus Lord, who may well make a public profession of faith in Christ, who may even prophesy or preach in his name or heal in his name, but who are not truly saved. There are many of the easy believism position popularized by Jack Hiles and others of his persuasion who seem to believe that all you have to do is agree to say a sinner's prayer one time, get baptized, and that's it. You're saved and you're secure. And there are, because of that, there are many church members and many churches that have prayed such a sinner's prayer, but were never truly born again, and who remain completely unregenerate to this day. The Bible has much to say about the marks or the characteristics of a true believer. And it gives us several things that we can look for in judging righteous judgment in this regard. A one dear lady told me recently that Pastor she knows uh, can tell if someone was truly saved because when he shared the gospel with them, uh, they gave him the Holy Ghost stare. The Holy Ghost stare. I don't know what that is. May I say that is not judging righteous judgment. That's not, that's not a basis for dis discerning if someone's saved or not. Because when you share the gospel, they give you that Holy Ghost stare. These Pentecostals, they just put the Bible on the shelf and just basically preach whatever comes into their head. Then they blame the Holy Ghost for putting it in their head. You know, and sorry, that's just a silly thought you had. You had some bad pizza or something. The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Peter said, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures have any private interpretation, or any private origin either, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost wrote the Bible, and he expects us to know and to follow the Bible Amen. and to base righteous judgment only on what is written down in this book. Amen. And the Bible has much to say about the characteristics or the marks of a true believer and gives us some things that we need to look for in judging righteous judgment. We've been over this ground many times, but for, the, for those who need to hear it again, first of all, if a man is truly born again, if he is born of God, if he is born from above, the Bible says at the point of conversion, he is regenerated, he is recreated. And that recreation involves a radical change in nature. Which is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When a person is born again, he does begin a spiritual walk that includes growth over time, no doubt. Uh, but the Bible also says that there are immediate changes 
that take place the moment every true believer becomes a child of God. For instance, at the point of conversion, number one, every believer is resurrected from spiritual death to spiritual life. Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 1, You hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Number two, at the point of conversion, a believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, there is no such thing as a born-again child of God that is not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 10, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So, every believer is resurrected. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Number three, at the point of conversion, a believer is given new spiritual eyes. The ability to see truths of God's kingdom that we were once blind to. We covered that point already and going over how we who have been born again now have the mind of Christ. Covered that. And number four, at the point of conversion, a believer is translated into God's kingdom. We read in Colossians 1, 12 to 13. And that means, as Jesus said, we are now no longer of this world. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 14. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 16, he said again, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If you've been born again, you are no more of this world than Jesus is. That's true of every believer. And because we are now not of this world, and we're now just passing through, we are no longer at home in this world. We have a longing to be home with the Lord, as Paul said. As such, we no longer have a love of this world and of worldly things that we used to have. That's why John says in 1 John 2, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Number five, at the point of conversion, a believer is given a new nature. Where Peter says, in fact, we become partakers of the divine nature. Ephesians 4, 17-24, Paul talks about that also. So therefore, as a result of these immediate changes that take place at the point of conversion, what should be immediate results of regeneration. The Bible, therefore, says that every believer, every truly born-again believer, will, therefore, begin to exhibit certain marks or defining characteristics. And number one, the Bible says as a result of the new birth, every believer will love the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's a fact. Jesus said in John 8, 42, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. In other words, if you've been truly born again, born of the Father, if God's your Father, you love me, he said. And 1 John 4, 19, John said, we love him because he first loved us. And Paul said, if any man love not the Lord Jesus, let him be anathema, accursed. Because why? He's not saved. If you've been truly saved, you love the Lord Jesus. To know him is to love him. And I believe a man that cannot say that he loves the Lord Jesus does not know him, has not met him, and may one day hear the Lord Jesus say, as he said in Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Uh, number two, the Bible says that as a result of the new birth, every believer, I believe, will receive, will be receptive to, and will submit to the authority of the word of God will receive and submit to the authority of the word of God. Jesus said in John 8, verse 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye, talking to the Pharisees, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jesus said, you won't listen to God's word because you're not of God. You have not been born of God. A truly born again person is actually born again because of the word of God. And therefore, he's going to love that word. He'll be receptive to it. He'll recognize it as his authority. Number three, the Bible says that as a result of the new birth, uh, every believer, true believer, will love other Christians. That's, a, that's an evidence. John says in 1 John 3, verse 14, John says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. John says that's an evidence of the new birth. Jesus said, in John 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know 
that you might that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. Another evidence of true regeneration. The Bible says as a result of the new birth, every believer will not love the world. We talked about that. We've been called out of this world. We're not of this world anymore. And John said in 1 John 2.15, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. A fifth characteristic remark of a believer is as a result of the new birth, every believer will hate sin. I do believe that. As a result of the new birth, every believer will hate sin. That's why we read in 1 John 3.9, very important verse, 3, 1 John 3.9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Covered this in depth before in other, other uh, messages, but we see uh, these evidences in the Bible. We know these things, and then we see a professing believer who fails to exhibit these things. And when that happens, I still say that we have to be very cautious in judging the salvation of a professing believer because another characteristic of every believer is this, number six. The Bible says that despite the miracle of the new birth, every believer will still battle the old nature and will still struggle against sin. Galatians 5:17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Paul also says in Romans 7, 18, talking about himself, he says, For I know that in me, as in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. I want to do God's will. He says, But how to perform that which is good I find not. Verse 19, he says, For the good that I would, that I want to do, I do not. But the evil, which I don't want to do, that's... What I find myself doing, Paul says, the fact is that true believers struggle every day against temptation to sin. They do sin at times, and they do backslide, and they do at times even fall, fall back into old addictions. In this area, the difference between a true believer and a make-believer is that a true believer, though he will sin, he will be miserable in his sin. He will hate it. That's why we read in 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In other words, he cannot continue in sin because God won't let him. God will make him miserable in his sin. God will not allow him to continue in sin. He's, he's not allowed to sin. He cannot sin. The Holy Spirit will convict that man of his sin and make him miserable in it. And therefore, a truly born-again believer will be far more receptive to correction than a make-believer would be. While a make-believer, on the other hand, is going to be very quick to cite Matthew 7, 1. You can't judge me. Judge not that you be not judged. Personally, I've met many folks who claim to be Christian, but who I knew that I knew that they were not saved. They couldn't be. We all know folks like that. And I still say that we need to be very cautious in judging another man's salvation and claims to be saved. As a general rule, I do not say to such a person, you are not saved, or you cannot be saved. On the other hand, I have said many times to several folks that they better examine themselves and see if they're saved, truly. Because the Bible says that a true believer is born again and has a new nature and will exhibit certain marks that they do not exhibit. You don't act like a believer. You better examine yourself. I've said that to many people. As the Apostle Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, important verse, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, Paul says. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, Paul says. Know ye not that your own selves, how Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? He says examine yourself. You don't act like a Christian. He says to those who show no fruit of the new birth, who don't seem to love the Lord Jesus or submit to his word, you better examine yourself and see if you're truly saved. Because if you're truly saved, the Lord Jesus is living inside of you, changing you from the inside out. There's going to be fruit. You're going to see a change. So, as a general rule, 
I don't say to such a man or woman, you're not saved, you cannot be saved. However, I have on a few occasions broken my general rule and done exactly that. Uh, one example in particular was a woman who had uh, at one time claimed to receive Christ as her Savior, but who had been most unfaithful to her husband, who was and is a very strong Christian. She was in the middle of an adulterous relationship and was refusing to submit to her husband or to honor her marriage vows. I attempted, you know, to restore this woman, to talk to her, counsel her, and restore her, pointed out to her what the Bible says about her sin, her obligation to her marriage, how wonderful her husband was to her, and she could not have cared less what the Bible says about her obligation or about her sin or about her, her marriage vows. In fact, she said to me point blank, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm not going to stay married to a man that, in her words, uh, wanted to be so holy and goody-goody. This is a woman who claimed to be Christian, claimed to be saved. So I told her, if you can tell me that you don't care what this book says about your marriage or about your sin, then on the authority of God's word, I say to you that you are not saved. And you need to get saved. Because Jesus said in John 8, 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Her response at that point, was, well, that's fine, because that means when I divorce him, he'll be free to move on. That was her reaction. You're right, I'm not saved. Fine, let's get on with it. You know, be, be done with it. That was her reaction. So I have I've broken my general rule on occasion. But all that said, we do need to be very careful and cautious in judging another man's salvation that claims to be saved. At the same time, I also still say that any man or woman who claims to be saved but who does not love the Lord Jesus or who will not receive uh, or submit to the authority of God's word or who has no love for other Christians, no desire to be in church, meet together with other, other believers or to any man who is still in love with the things of this world and who does not hate his own sin, um, to any man that has no grief or misery over his own sin and thinks he can just live it up and sin with impunity, I say there's very good reason to doubt if that man is truly saved. And any person who is in that condition had better examine himself, as Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So that will do it for tonight. I just wanted to address those few points uh, to add to what Brother Josh already covered. As Christians, we are to judge all things. We are to call sinners to repentance from their sin. We need to rebuke them openly, and that means to their face. Heretics that promote heresy but publicly should be rebuked publicly. We should be specific, and we should not spare professing Christians. We are to cry aloud and spare not, to preach out against sin. We are to separate ourselves from sin and from sinners and to reprove the darkness that prevails in our society. And we are called upon to rebuke others at times when they are in a sin that needs to be repented of. But as we do this, we need to stay balanced. And remember that, number one, we need to judge ourselves first. And number two, we need to make sure that we're judging by God's standard, not man's and not our own. And then number three, we need to be very cautious in judging another man's salvation who claims to be saved. In other words, Judge all things, but judge righteous judgment. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have given us a new nature. We thank you that when you saved us, you didn't leave us like we were, in that miserable condition, having been turned over to a reprobate mind. But you gave us a new mind, a new nature, a new hatred for sin, a new love for your word, a new thirst for righteousness. We thank you so much, Lord God for the new nature that you gave us through your Holy Spirit, through the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. And I just pray for any who have not experienced that, that they would come to know what it means to be truly born again. And help us all, Lord, as we do uh, go about in our lives, help us to remember that we are called to help our brother who has stumbled to get back up. We're called to help him, to restore him, to help him get back in the battle, get back serving Christ again. And help us to do that in the spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, 
lest we too be tempted. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.